Yeah, Ali Madad. Thank you for joining me this evening, afternoon, morning, whatever it is in your time zone. I'm very pleased that you have decided to spend some time with us. I'm very pleased today to have the opportunity to speak with Mr. Jean Ayou, who is the General Secretary of the International Social Services, an NGO based in Geneva. Before I introduce our, my guest, I'd like to give you a little bit of context about this conversation. We all know that conflict is incredibly destructive. It is destructive for families, it's destructive for individuals, it's destructive for our communities. And for that reason, we wanna make sure we deal with conflict as it arises. It is particularly destructive when it's a family conflict. I remember my law school prof 30 years ago when I was at a law school, said the family law was going to like any other law we would ever practice. Because it is within families and in families that our personhood is realized and our communities are created. And for that reason, when there is a family conflict, it is profoundly painful. And it permeates all other aspects of our lives. Malana Hazri Imam has placed enormous importance on dealing with conflict, dealing with conflict wherever it arises. And he has given us direction and guidance that whenever we're dealing with conflict, and particularly when we're dealing with family conflict, we not only resolve the conflict itself, but we try to bandage those wounds. Bandage those wounds so that people can move forward and onto their lives with confidence and a sense of the future. And that's what these conversations are really all about. We are incredibly fortunate to have an international system so that within our system, we are able to seamlessly deal with conflicts between families who live in different jurisdictions. Every CAB member knows that the person that they are supporting in their jurisdiction there is an equally beloved and equally important member of the Jamaat on the other side, in the other side of the world, in another jurisdiction. And so the CAB members deal with this as a team, with each of us dealing with the, the individual in our jurisdiction, recognizing that there is an equally beloved individual on the other side. It's because of this international experience that we have been able to participate in some of the work that the International Social Services Society does, social services does in the family mediations that they work on. We have participated in some of the work that they have done with respect to rules of practice and processes along the way. And of course, we ourselves have enormously benefited from that collaboration. I'd like to introduce you to Jean Ayoub and the organization itself. International Social Services is an organization with long history, created uh, you know, almost 97 years of service, created after the, Second, uh, the First World War with all of the disruption that the war brings uh, to, to, uh, to a community, to Europe at that time, and has continued to serve, protect, and deal with uh, conflicts and issues uh, around around the world. Today, it serves uh, in 150 different countries. And Jean Ayoub, who is the general secretary, has been at the helm since 2007, which is a remarkable uh, long history and, of course, brings lots of experience with that. And before he joined the IISS, uh, he was part of the Red Cross, the International Red Cross. And so he comes with that international experience and has the wealth of, of expertise to share with us. And what I wanted to have a conversation about uh, Jean, because he is able to, to reach out to 150 different countries uh, around the world uh, to be able to give us some insight uh, into uh, what's happening in the world around family conflicts uh, worldwide. Welcome, Jean. Thank you very much for joining us. Julie, thank you very much for having me on this uh, on this show. 
I think I mean you know I'm really honored and and uh, delighted to be there, and I would just like to start by saying, yes, we are a very large global organization, but the Secretary General in front of you will give you a non-filtered, non-expert opinion about what I see in the world. As you said it, we have experts in family mediation, we have experts in casework, we have experts in many of the social services. We, we, we direct every day, including research, publications, and advocacy issues. I had all that, that is true, but I remain the non-expert head of this organization, and my interventions will be from these lenses. You're being way too modest, Jean. But let me start with that. From, that. from the gleaning that you have from the experts in the field, which is fair enough, that's where you're giving the credit, what the last 18 months covid has been a very very difficult period of time for the world overall what are you seeing with respect to family conflicts and family issues around the world i think in general and to set the scene i would be you know very very honest and say i personally don't believe that covid has introduced new problems I don't think COVID has created new issues that we need to deal with. It has only exacerbated existing issues that we were dealing with. It has exacerbated uh, 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 issues we were dealing with because the stress levels were higher, because at one point of time, since the COVID-19 became a pandemic, we were dealing in the very beginning of it, in the beginning of 2020, and for some even before, with the unknown. And even Mm. governments and authorities did not really know how to direct the population, what advice to give to the population. I remember the, 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 the dialogue or even the argumentation around wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. I remember the argumentation about staying at home or not staying at home, closing schools or not closing skills, schools, and all, all these, these issues has exacerbated existing stress on families. Of course, the effect on the, on, the, on the standard family varies with the situation of the family, with the economic situation of the family, with the composition of the family. It's fair to say, for example, that the stress le- le- level on a monoparental family is much higher than on a complete family, that you have more people, more adults, to cope with a certain level of of stress. I think that is one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is that when you are in a stress level or when you are in an anxiety level, you need a service. And lockdowns and confinements made it that the available services became scarce and became a rarity, even became un... un, un, uh, you You couldn't find them anymore because you don't have access, because... You know, you don't have the service because the service closed down because of the COVID. There were addresses you would go for for uh, for an examination, for social support, for psychological support, and all these addresses closed down one after the other. Luckily, and fortunately, not all over the world, but we did have major disruption in the delivery of those services, and those in turn increased the levels of anxiety and stress over families, individuals and families. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, globally, did you, what are the kinds of issues you are seeing with respect to migration and concerns that come from that sphere of your work? I think, Julie, it's fair to say that in the 21st century, we have the highest level of migration among populations, not only south to north, but south to south, south to south, and north to north, basically. That is one. Two, among these populations, children are a majority today, unfortunately. And we know for a fact that this situation being exacerbated, the financial stress on certain families, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, they would just clear up what little money they have to pay, unfortunately, for smugglers to take their uh, minor, not even 18 years old, sometimes not even 15 or 12 years old, 
to go and head north to, to, to try to reach Europe. The same from Latin America, South America to North America. The same in Asia from poorer countries to richer countries. And that, that, that we have seen in, 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 in growing in, in exponential numbers. Mm-hmm. And at one point in time, you have situations where it's just out of hand. And um, from your perspective, have there been kind of pockets or areas of hope and glimmer that you've seen communities come together or ways in which we've been able to adjust to, to, to this uh, global Absolutely. Spread? Absolutely. You know, we, 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 as we say in French, that the necessity is the mother of creation, basically. And I think we can say that in many other languages. And we have seen that. We have fortunately seen that across the world. I can bring my own experience as judge on what is called the European Social Network Awards for 2021. We are, we are looking at global projects that where innovation and in the, in the, in the work of social work have come to terms to deal with stressful situations, essentially in this year in the COVID-19 second year. And we have seen a lot of, of, of uh, very good initiatives that have come together. One of them is, is about my own, uh, my own organization. Of course, as you know, social work is about personal contact, is about visiting homes, is about social inquiries, about asking questions and things like that. And all of a sudden, in March, April 2020, all of this stopped. And we had to adapt, and we had to adapt quickly, and we had to use modern technology or available technology. I wouldn't even call it modern because it's there for 20 years now. And uh, just to adapt our way we deliver service. And we managed that transformation in less than three weeks. And that was for me and for all our colleagues a great achievement. And in other countries like Ireland, like Italy, a couple of countries in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in Asia, and maybe those countries who are very hard hit since the very beginning. Uh, 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 by, by the, by the COVID-19. Uh, we have seen, uh, for example, in these countries, all social work students were called from their universities, from their offline or online courses, basically, to assist those social workers whom workload has been doubled or tripled because of the situation. And that, that had a great effect because uh, all of a sudden, the social workforce was bigger and can cope with more and more inquiries and things like that. A similar, a similar initiative where we had in certain communities, scattered communities and, and, and regions, that you have the social workforce who actually centralize their efforts and put all their efforts behind uh, uh, 24-7 uh, helplines where they can answer, they can counsel, they can, they can, they can, they can uh, just uh, uh, talk about stories like bedtime stories for, to, to, to ease up the pressure on, uh, on, uh, on, on children and families. A fourth and the last one I could talk about is this uh, targeting the generational gap between the elderly and between the young by using applications, by using handheld devices just to open up and these youngsters and these elderly Within the family, they would share some time to, to, to read stories. They share a time, a tablet time or a screen time to watch a documentary or watch a movie, for example, together. It can be two persons. It can be 200 persons on the same program. And that brought a lot of relief to these communities. Mm-hmm. So, yes, there was a lot of, in, 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 uh, luckily, a lot of imagination, a lot of creation. It was fast and it was effective. Mm-hmm. And in the area of family mediations, have you been able to see any innovation that has happened in, in, in your organization? In, in that particularly, uh, yeah, please, sorry. As a, particularly as it relates to international um, mediation work. I can't talk about innovation per se. What I can say is that increased services, increased pressure on our services, and unfortunately, and this is the unintended effect of the pandemic, we had an increase in separation, we had an increase in, in, in family conflicts, we had an increase in domestic violence, and all that necessitated not only our mediation services, 
but the general social services in, 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 in particular, uh, particular social service, some other particular social services in general to support these families. There was uh, an exponential, I don't have the figures, fortunately or unfortunately, because I'm afraid of the figures, but there was a lot of family breakups. Mm -hmm. And in that area of, of uh, sort of family um, conflict and family mediation work, um, what are some of the, 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 the ideas or gems of, of, of advice that is coming from the field around early warning systems? What are the things that we need to be paying attention to uh, to minimize um, the potential of that very deep sense of conflict? I would, I would uh, if I may, I would answer this question, but juggle it with an answer to other questions about, in general, what are, you know, what, what are the early signs we need to, to, to look at in, in, a, in, a, in a family? Essentially linked to confinement, linked to lockdowns. Some of them, some of us perhaps have some, have the chance to live in larger houses or larger apartments or some. And some of us have do not have this chance, and we find ourselves crammed five to six to seven people in a very small, small, small very small premises with no. And again, this is the unknown factor. We did not know that the confinement was for one week, for two weeks. Sometimes in some countries it was up to eight, even ten weeks, basically. And in this situation, I think the family problems exploded, and the early signs we could have read them perhaps, but you know, just to summarize them a little bit, I think it's, it is a situation really where, where sleeping becomes a luxury at the end of the day, because all family members are stressed at different levels and things like that. That's, that's an early sign. Another sign, very practical sign, I can think of uh, 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 issues related to myself, where yelling replaces talking where judging replaces uh, 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 replaces uh, 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 replaces listening, replacing asking questions, basically. I think occupational and recreation activities that we used to do as a home, as a family, become separate activities, become individual activities. We try to do them in our own room, or we try to do them with external partners that have nothing to do with the family and things like that rather than, than, than keeping within the family. And all of these signs, they have their own solutions inside in terms mm -hmm. of if we don't have activities together, let us try to have activities together. That would be, uh, that, that would be, that would be one of uh, the solutions. The work-life balance becomes a challenge. I have one of, my, one of my partners who told me, when I come to, uh, at work, I think about the problems at home. And when I go home, I think about my underperformance at work. And mm -hmm. this, this, this lack of balance or this break of, break of balance is, is an early sign, uh, is an early sign. And again, irrelevant of age, young and adults start to have these symptoms, stomach ache and, and headaches and neck aches and things like that. And they can be psychosomatic, they can be real, but they are, they are, they are born, born out of stress. Uh, there's a loss of warmth and friendliness in the relationship, and we experience that, unfortunately. Sometimes we act on it, sometimes we try to forget about it and say, well, it's one of these days, and then it's one of these weeks, and then, then, then unfortunately, it's, uh, 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 it's out of control. We have this overall feeling unhappy, dissatisfied, dis disappointed, and even desperate. This is what I call personally... Uh, we, we reach that, that, uh, that situation where we say, I have given it all and it's just not working moment mm -hmm. in life. So mm -hmm. you see, these are just like the simple, basic, uh, basic down to earth signs, which I think we need to be, we need to be very attentive to. Absolutely. This is certainly one of the areas of work that, that all of us need to be paying attention to the mental health needs of the communities in which we work and we live in and, and, and live with uh, has just become uh, a, an important part of, of how we have to take care of ourselves. It's not just the physical part of our caring of our, of our bodies, but the mental health part. And it's in that that 
conflicts really emerge in a in a significant way uh, along along the uh, along the way. So uh, that is certainly an important part of it. Do you have any other gems of ideas or or uh, advice that you would uh, give? Particularly, uh, I'm you know. You've, you've talked about the impact on children. Is there anything else you want us to be aware of with respect to that particular area? Well, one, one thing which is uh, uh, as, as clear as clear water, actually. The children usually like to be outdoors. If we adults are, are sometimes cold or sometimes hot or something like that, we try, we, we try to stay indoors. Children like to stay outdoors, irrelevant. They, they like to mingle, they like to reach out their... Uh, to their, uh, to their, uh, uh, to their, uh, to their friends and things like that. We have seen children, which probably in normal days would be a dream come true for parents. We have seen children longing to go to school. We have seen children missing going to school, and I think that was a sign that you know many things happened during this pandemic. The uh, uh, governments and authorities and and leading people that have come better and better in giving directions when it comes to prevention, when it comes to health, when it comes to vaccines and things like that. We have missed on some of the some of the family related, children related stress that can be can can lead to mental health and mental health to mental health issues. I think we missed on that. I think in, in 2021 we can became better, but it has been long months since since we became better in that. I, I'm not sure I have another. I mean, I, I have something which is not an idea, which is not, which is not something. And, and, and I see and I apply it in my in my daily life. When I was much younger and learning English, I came across this sentence in Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary, which is "live and let live," basically. And I think this this, if we look at the early signs of uh, of uh, of uh, if the early signs of family family stress and things like that. I think as simple as it's read and as simple as this uh, understood, this this uh, this sentence holds a key to many of the issues, many of the issues we deal with. And I think being attentive to that, at least it has marked me for years and years. Till today, I'm talking about it, actually. I've spoken about it in another keynote address I made three days ago, basically. And live and let live is the basis of open dialogue of listening instead of talking all the time, is understanding the other, is reaching out to the other and things like that. That's it. Thank you. That is a very nice way to end because we can talk about how that, for, for most times, families are the kind of template from which we build entire societies, right? You can't have democracy in a larger world if you have don't have democracy and, or have tyranny in your family. Uh, and so that's the kind of, depending on what we want as a society, we are going to be building the little template in our own homes. And, and that sure. message of live and let live is a very important one. Thank you very much, Jean, for your conversations. It was really Thank you. Thank wonderful you to for have that. Thank you. We have chosen the theme of resilience and courage as the theme for these conversations. And resilience comes from a level of preparation, a level of confidence in the future, a level of anticipation, and to know that you've got a system and a network to support you as you move forward. Resilience as a Jamaat as an org is comes from first of all the enormous enormous devotion of our Imam to our well-being, and to create for us institutions that we can count on at times of distress. The international and the, the conciliation and arbitration boards are one such institution, where throughout the world in 19 jurisdictions where the Jamaat is living, we have with 800 volunteers ready to assist you at times like that. And part of this conversation was to say that we live and work with people in a holistic way. Although the cab system is independent and, and will remain and, you, the and what you share there will be confidential, we have a way in which we can facilitate 
interaction with sister institutions that can help in other areas of your life because they are all together the imams institutions designed to serve the jamaat your act of courage is to reach out to reach out for help because no one else can actually do that for you and we can only assist you when you voluntarily come to seek our help i hope that this conversation has given you confidence to know that the that the cab system and all of its people are trained to be able to assist you and ready to help you when you reach out for support across borders and within your own jurisdictions so wherever you are today we wish you and your family safety health happiness and a sense of well-being do take care of your mental health as well khuda hafiz Thank you, Yalimadad, and wishing you all the very best. Thanks.